Thanks. Um, as you just heard, my career followed the great advice about from Yogi Berra. If you uh, come to a fork in the road, you should take it. Uh, and what I'd like to do today is just share my science communication experience. Uh, and I like to tell stories, so there'll be a few illustrative stories that highlight some of my experience. But at the end, I have a few slides that will collect the list of uh, barriers that I encountered and finish with some lessons. So in some ways, uh, I have a broad experience, but the caveat is it's actually fairly narrow. That is, it's biomedical research. Um, and my academic experiences ended uh, a little bit more than two decades ago. In academia, well, actually I'm a first generation. So in high school I played sports, I worked, I was interested in girls, and I was proud that I never took home a book. My high school counselor told me I'd be wasting my parents' money if I went to college. But my mother sent a $100 deposit to the college that took my older brother, and they automatically accepted siblings. You're getting good laughter later, here. You did? Good. Three years later, just as you heard from Bambi Berenbaum, I had a great teacher, a pharmacologist. And whatever he taught, I wanted to be. He opened my eyes to science, and it changed my life. Uh, and in fact, if he was an entomologist, I would have been an entomologist. Um, as soon as I got into graduate school, uh, I knew this is what I should be doing. If you were curious and uninhibited and a little irreverent, there was nothing better than graduate school. Uh, after my master's degree, I was accepted to University of Maryland Medical School. When I got there, I found two surprises. One, the stipend was awful, $1,600 a year. And secondly, um, the, the department was very tired. Now, this was the very early 60s, and I heard about something outside of Washington in a place called Bethesda that had something called the NIH. And after doing some homework, I applied for and was awarded a fellowship which had a decent stipend, but it even had a $5,000 research grant. Uh, by the way, that was pertinent, because there was only three research grants in the university, whole University of Maryland at that time. So for a little while, I thought I had $85,000 a year. R regardless. I then decided to buy in several journals, Science, Nature, the Journal of Pharmacology, Experimental Therapeutics, and JBC. And I got other graduate students to join a journal club, and we shamed the faculty member into working on that journal club. Um, I then took a postdoc position and had an academic position at Washington U. And let me pause by saying my personal experience was overwhelmingly positive, and I regard the life of a scientist in biomedical research as a privileged life. In my life, in fact, there were two great social inventions. One was the Marshall Plan by which this country, we built Europe, and the second was the National Institutes of Health. Uh, that unleashed the great biomedical enterprise of our time. You know, you were able to apply based on merit. It wasn't a matter of hair professor or a shogun who, who, or even an academic institution. The NIH fostered independence. It provided the resources. It encouraged innovation and some flexibility. And I can tell you, to a young scientist in a nurturing institution like Washington University, the only limitation was your talent and your energy. I mean, I think we're concerned about um, communication to protect these enterprises and make sure people understand it. 
Now, about scientific communication as an academic, that would mean publications, abstracts, meeting presentations. And by the way, in the early 60s, there was just one great meeting in Atlantic City called FACIB. So you could tap in to all of the leading scientists and meet the people. And then grant applications, ultimately editorial boards and study sections. Technical communication, even before computers, while it was slow, it was quite efficient. But we largely talked to experts in our own field. We used three-letter three jo three letter jargon codes, uh, codes um, and we didn't and couldn't communicate with others. And uh, at that time, we looked at the public discourse as a distraction from tenure or from advancing the science. Um, and there was no scientific incentive to do it. Um, my first teaching experience was interesting. I was asked to participate in a panel, and I was sitting uh, next to this very great and famous retired English pharmacologist by the name of Harold Byrne, who had discovered part of the autonomic nervous system. And I was looking at my notes getting ready when this man in the 70s leaned over. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm preparing for my lecture. He took my notes away. And he says, look, young man, if you don't know it, don't teach it. And the other lesson I learned with time is, and it's been mentioned before, know your audience. Medical students then wanted to be doctors. They don't want to be students. And you should frame it accordingly. Um, I won't talk about uh, the barrier of academic meetings, but just say, Paraphrasing Henry Kissinger, the reason that academic arguments were so intense was because the stakes were so small. Ultimately, uh, when I became uh, chair of pharmacology, uh, we had limited numbers of meetings. We administered over the coffee pot. But we invented what was the single greatest communication experience that I ever encountered. We decided three times a week to have brown bag lunches. Once a week would be a research seminar. And the head of a department, the head of a lab, every postdoc and every graduate would have to take a turn. And then two other times were a journal club. And because it was a small department, you really came up a number of times a year. And the invention was every other talk had to be outside your scientific field. And very soon, an entry-level graduate with student would see that the head of a department is just as stupid as I am in a, in, a, in a subject that they don't know. Well, these sessions were freewheeling, they were irreverent, they were Talmudic, and they were rigorous, data-driven science. This was a great learning and teaching device and in an environment where faculty and staff flourished, learned new fields, how to learn how to communicate, and knew how to think on their feet. Uh, I left academia because a pharmacologist does pragmatic research, dissecting diseases to find therapeutic controls. Uh, and I happened to make discoveries that had therapeutic potential. And in those days and, and these days, you can't finish something like that in academia. Um, a comparison of academia and industry which bears on communication, uh, if your research goes well in academia, there are many routes to success. You either do observational or hypo uh, hypothetical research, hypothesis-based, uh, and that leads to good places in publications. Um, and it has an open-ended timeline if you do competitive things. Industry is really applied science. It has very harsh timelines and very harsh productivity targets. Uh, and it's driven by competition and market expectation. The metric is 
a successful product that gets regulatory approval, an appropriate market share, and a competitive position. By definition, then, the great barrier at this level of industrial research is you have to be secretive. It has to protect your discoveries. You have to develop intellectual property in order to achieve a competitive position. So that means a very long delay in publications and presentations uh, so you execute that business strategy and is a pretty strong influence of, of the legal people and the business people. Uh, now, there's two aspects of industrial communication I talk on. One about how do you build a culture and how do you get scientists to talk to each other when you're talking about big science? Well, uh, my initial attitude was if they were dumb enough to recruit me, I was going to do it my way. And since I had spent 25 years in the NIH culture, we were going to run the, cult, the company as if it was NIH. So there was a need for a simple, clear messages, and that data was the coinage of the system. Now, I often manage things by coffee mugs. And one of the first ones I distributed said, in God we trust all else bring data. My office door had a sign. It says, if you have data, walk right in. If you don't, my administrator might get you in in a few weeks. One interesting illustrative point, um, a bright young woman, a Hispanic scientist, sheepishly came into my office and presented her work. And it was tremendously interesting and complicated. And we had several meetings, and we exchanged emails uh, as she really moved that problem forward. Well, one day I met her boss in the hall. Uh, and I said to the boss, um, you know, I don't really understand some aspect of the data. And he looked glassy-eyed, and I said, you know, you don't seem to know the data. He said, well, yes, that's true, but I have so many people reporting to me. To which I said, remind me, let's see, she is four or five levels below me, and she knows the data, and I know the data, so remind me why I need you. Um, that became legendary in the company, and also the fact that I would wander out in the laboratories, drop in and sit with people's notebooks, and have fun pouring over the data. That on email became known as shark attacks. Uh, the reality is good ones flourish, others change in that kind of an environment, and it's a, it's a culture that you could move forward. Now, how do you communicate with a big team? Bright scientists want the identity, big goal. Well, eventually we had an interesting um, invention. It was setting a goal document. So uh, based on data and review and other things, I would sit with my major leadership, the dukes and duchesses of the realm, and I would lay out the big goals and the stretch goals. And they would go back, push back, and define it. But each of them had to take a specific aspect that delivered the whole. And then that cascaded through all the levels of the company and so in one clear message, it was understandable, it was interesting, people knew what was important, and they knew where they fit. This then was circulated to, and at various times I had two to 5,000 scientists. It was circulated to everyone for final comment, circulated to the business, and then I negotiated with the CEO that that was the basis of our reward system. Um, uh, that was a system that generated some pretty remarkable drugs. Now, about um, I'll come back to uh, about external communication um, in big pharma if you're a leader. Well, there are several important arenas. There's security analysts. There's investment meetings. 
there's uh, journalists, and finally there's the FDA. And earlier someone talked about the risk rewards of communication. Consider that when I would present to analysts or at a meeting or at the FDA, that the analysts are sitting there with laptop computers con connected to the Wi-Fi. So, for example, when we were presenting a new drug to the FDA with its first public attack against you and then FDA, the stocks fell five to ten points before you could answer a, a, a question. And our approaches there was like our approaches you heard before. It's about data and that data should speak. We went to the trouble of even renting a theater and reconstructing the uh, meeting room. We reduced millions of pages of case report forms to about 200 data slides. We prepared the talk. We, we worked on it ourselves. And then we brought in external experts in the field. And finally, we brought in uh, retired FDA people. Uh, and ultimately, that was fine-tuned. And then at the meeting itself, we set up in the hotel a war room, an IT war room with seven computers connected to the data in several places. Uh, and we set out and answered every slide with data within 20 seconds. Um, eventually, the FDA, if that went on, finally said, okay, we give up, we trust the data. Um, we eventually got three approved drugs in COX-2 in, in arthritis and in colon cancer, and, and this kind of effort involved a 1,000 people. Lastly, I just want to switch to communication and community science centers. There, the support mechanism is either public tax report, philanthropy, or admissions. And so it's very important to communicate and engage these people now, Missouri is a very, very conservative state. There are many people who think the Earth is 5,774 years old, uh, that they think there is no climate change. They almost voted to penalize not only doing stem cell research, but, but making a felony for physicians who would use stem cells. So. Uh, just a couple of the devices by which we communicated. So uh, I think dealing with controversy in communication is important. So we brought in a Darwin exhibit, opened up for public debate, and it went very well. And part of the reason it went well was the pro side was presented by students, especially medical students, who were trusted and it was balanced. When we had a climate change, Ralph Cicerone flew to St. Louis in a snowstorm and gave a talk, uh, and then met with the students. Uh, instead of press conferences, he met the students in our disadvantaged student program. Uh, and if you don't know Ralph's life story, he came from a, a rural Pennsylvania background where he was first in college, and he really showed them what's possible if you work hard. Uh, another exhibit we brought in that was controversial was called Body, Work, Body Worlds or Body Works. You might have seen it. These are cadavers that are preserved, um, and you could view anatomic uh, important things. And this particular exhibit was going to emphasize the brain, and it was pretty controversial. Uh, now, we wanted to think, how can we communicate a controversial subject, but also greatly increase the constituency that's interested in science in the city that really needs it, and reach, bring, brings new audiences? Long story short, uh, my wife and I are also donors to the St. Louis Symphony, uh, and I happened to meet our maestro, the wonderful David Robertson, the day after a concert. And I said to him, you had a brilliant violinist who played this long, complicated, fast piece without any music. I said, how does the musical brain work? Uh, and he lit up and he says, you know, neurologists have started imaging. And when a professional musician first is learning music, 
its left hemisphere. But when they completely master it, it switches hemispheres. I said, wow. Uh, you can guess what happened. Ultimately, using all my, uh, my idiosyncrasy credits at Washington U in the imaging with the symphony, David Robertson agreed to undergo functional MRI, and he was going to select a piece of music that's rather abstract. He picked uh, John Adams' Dr. Atomic. Um, and, you know, images are collected every seven seconds, so you could run through all kinds of things. And as a control, it was either science, sections of Dr. Atomic, or computer-generated musical noise. And then you said, well, we really need a control, so we had to find a musical intellectual cretin, someone who doesn't know a sharp from a flat, me, as the control. And indeed, we did the imaging, uh, and as you would guess, my brain was very discreet, left hemisphere, and in fact, it showed areas of anxiety. And I said to Robertson, I actually like the random computer noise better than the Dr. Atomic, and he explained, he, I didn't understand that that was the section where in Los Alamos, they put the bomb in a tower, and an electric and lightning storm came, and they were afraid it was going to detonate. Well, his brain had not only shifted size, it, it, size, it, it activated many other areas, including, including linguistic and video shows he actually uh, mouths the song. Well, we brought in 700 people. It was televised to 14 science centers, three universities, um, and discs were made for education programs, and we did a positron emission, and it really made a difference. Last word before the slides. Then there's the part about fundraising. And fundraising should have an elevator speech. And I agreed to go to the Science Center because it was such an important inner city program where kids were picked out of the public inner cities in St. Louis, which have metal detectors and have about a 22% graduation rate. But a student could come and, in, and be in a program for four years, coming on Saturdays and after school, with a lot of dedicated support. Phil, but just to let you know, we're, we're running into the time. Okay, so uh, bottom line, uh, when a girl is asked, um, what is it like for you to be in a public school and deal with that? Her friends who are either pregnant or dropout, she says, they live for today and I live for tomorrow. And that's a pretty key message. Um, I could stop there. I have a few slides that emphasize. Maybe, Katie, go to the last two slides that would just show the lessons learned, kind of my uh, Ten Commandments of what I learned. So uh, yep, understand your audience. Uh, that's critical. So uh, Monsanto had catastrophic public relations and communications around bovine somatotropin and uh, genetically engineered plants. Of course, the public never understood uh, the value for them, and you can't win a controversy when they don't trust you and it's just data. Keep the message simple uh, and simplify complex messages. Just visualize Clinton explaining things at the Democratic Convention. Skip to four. Most scientists don't have readable slides, and there's data overload. You heard about the 37 gigabytes a day. Make it interesting. Tell stories so that they could visualize the data. The last slide. Next slide, please. Uh, scientists have got to eliminate jargon and think about how people could understand it. And data is much better than anecdotal things. Um, and you know, there's so much garbage out there, so people don't know. People are spending a lot of money on chondroitin or other things for arthritis. 
uh, people don't understand that there hasn't undergone double-blind placebo trials. Uh, the next to the last point, don't overpromise. That's where we make a mistake in science. People who talk about embryo stem cells and say we're going to be able to do something about Alzheimer's don't know the, the science and are uh, putting the, the public in the wrong direction. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Phil. That's great. So <clears throat> our next speaker is Diane Harley. Diane, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Let me introduce you. I'm glad, you, glad you've been able to make it. Diane Harley is a biosocial anthropologist who directs the Higher Education in the Digital Age project at UC Berkeley. Her work uh, includes a concurrent analysis of social, economic, and academic costs and benefits of new media in scholarship. That's led her to look at issues of peer review and the future of scholarly publishing, including understanding what academics get rewarded for. Diane?